Welcome to KSOC Uncensored. Tonight's guest is Dr. Murray Sabrin. Dr. Murray is an author. Now, I can't wait to read this book. Recently authored a book called From Immigrant to Public Intellectual, an American Story. And boy, is it from what I've read. I'm so happy to have you on today and to dive into your life story and your most recent book. Well, thank you, Kristen. It's great to be with you. Uh, it's It's been a hell of a ride since we arrived in America in 1949. Oh, my goodness. I was reading. You know, it's funny. I started reading your wiki and it, it's information that I like at a high level. So I was I was reading about one that you highlight your father. Uh, I'm just jumping right into it, as you can tell that your father, that you feel that you're alive today because he had a gun and he fought for you and your family utilizing it. Um, and I was going to talk about two way here, but that's something I just find incredible that, you know, not a lot of people can wrap their head around what you and your family went through, uh, during these times. Do you want to dive right into your stance sure. on two way and the importance and then tie it into, you know, your history with your father? Well, my father, uh, was, uh, entered the Polish army in 1939 when Germany invaded Poland, and he was in the Polish army for a while, and um, he was captured, put in a, a labor camp, and he was nearly shot because he was falsely accused of stealing a hammer, and he relays that in his memoir called We Dare to Live, and uh, he escaped from there. It was a, it was a low security uh, uh, camp, and then he uh, became a partisan commander in 1943, in the summer of 43, and he was in charge of 230 people repelling the uh, the uh, German invasion of Poland. And then uh, he was liberated by the Russian, the Soviet army in July of 1944. So effectively, the uh, war was over for him. And he recounts all his um, uh, exploits in his uh, memoir about World War II. And growing up, I used to ask him and my mother about uh, their experiences during World War II. And uh, everything that's in the book I, I knew about, except the last story uh, where he was asked to go on a mission in Germany, to Germany, and uh, he said, well, the war is over for me. I have a, a young child, my older brother, I have a wife. I'm not going to go on another mission. And uh, he ends the story by saying that 90% of the men who volunteered to go on the mission were killed. So if he had gone on the mission, there was a, would have been a high probability that he wouldn't have survived that uh, what, what turned out to be a virtual suicide mission. So uh, from 1944, um, uh, he settled in, uh, they settled in, um, in uh, Poland uh, with their native country. And then in 1946, they made a decision to leave Poland and they went to West Germany. My mother was pregnant with me and I was born in December 1946. And from there, uh, they made another decision, where do we move to? Because they didn't want to stay in West Germany. And so he wrote his great aunt who raised his mother in New York City at the turn of the 20th century. And he wrote his first cousin who came to America a couple of years earlier. And we arrived in Manhattan on a very hot August day, as my father told me, in 1949. We were met by my mother's aunt and uncle from Patterson, New Jersey. And uh, my mother was holding me. I was a two-year-old. And... Uh, her aunt says to her, you, you've been writing me that you have two boys, yet you're holding this little girl in your arms. Who is she? And he said, well, that's, that's my son. He had, and I had very long blonde hair. So, so that's an interesting tale about uh, what it was like growing up in Germany in, uh, in the late uh, 1940s. Anyway, I grew up in New York City, went through the public schools. Uh, I, I was fortunate enough to go to the Bronx High School of Science, which I think at that time was the top public high school in the country where a lot of uh, future Nobel Prize winners went to, uh, went to uh, high school. And um, from there, I decided to become a social studies teacher. So I went to Hunter College in the Bronx. And uh, for four years, I studied history and geography and um, other social studies subjects. Started teaching in New York City public schools. After a couple of years, I realized this was not going to be the career I wanted. And I um, got my master's along the way in social studies education. And then I uh, went to Rutgers starting in 1972 full time. Uh, and so I got into the PhD program in the geography department, but I wrote a dissertation on inflation. As a, as a footnote, I almost became the last American to be drafted in, uh, in the United States. Nixon ended the draft in January of 1973, and I was reclassified 1A in um, December, went to a pre-induction physical. I turned 26, and the draft board 
wrote me a nice letter saying you're no longer eligible for the draft. So I escaped the draft, which was at the time of the Vietnam War ending. Uh, the P Paris peace talks began in January of 1973. And of course, we saw the horrific um, uh, exit of Americans in April of 1975 when um, Americans were leaving the embassy in helicopters and barely escaped with their life as the uh, North Vietnamese took over South Vietnam. Anyway, I, I got my PhD in 1981. In the meantime, I had worked in the private sector as an, as a, an economist, a staff uh, investment analyst. And then by accident, I got my dream job at Ramapo College in 1985 teaching uh, finance. Uh, even though I don't have a degree in finance, I was uh, working as an investment analyst and an economist. So I was learning skills on the job of economic analysis, investment portfolio analysis. And um, that gave me a 35 year career at the college. And I ended the, my career in the last few years teaching the financial history of the United States. I think one of the most important things I did as a college professor, because it uh, highlighted how the United States evolved, not only economically and financially, but politically as well. And the students just loved the course because uh, they didn't have to do any number crunching. It was basically a history course that was uh, imbued with a lot of economics and financial um, uh, information. And so they really appreciated when we got to the financial crisis of 2008, how this all came about because of the Federal Reserve um, blowing up the financial sector with all this cheap money, which gave us this unsustainable housing bubble. And now we're in another bubble that's unwinding because of the reaction to the housing bubble uh, and the uh, financial crisis of um, uh, 2008, 2009. And now, of course, we've got the financial bubble because of the COVID lockdowns and all the money that the Federal Reserve has thrown at, in the economy to uh, stimulate the economy when it shouldn't have been locked down in the first place. And so the Federal Reserve keeps right. on doing the same thing over and over again. And here we are on the uh, threshold of another recession, which is basically to clean out, if you will, uh, the, uh, the distortions in the economy caused by this cheap money. And then we'll be right, off to the right. races for another bubble. So uh, that's where we are. I've written we four books. Back. Do you think we should go back to the gold standard? Yeah, gold is the original money that human beings decided many hundreds of years ago because you cannot print it. You have to use resources to get it out of the ground. So the growth of the money supply in gold is very small compared to the available supply of money and therefore prices don't go up. You cannot have a sustained inflation with a gold standard. Uh, in fact, what you have is a wonderful thing for the, for the average worker. You have slowly falling prices. That's called a natural deflation. I, in, in the mid 1950s when Color TV came out, I was a youngster in elementary school and color TVs back then were $1,000 for a new TV. That's comparable to about $12,000 today. And as in my unexperienced uh, economic thinking, I said, why would anyone buy a TV right now when it first comes out? Why don't they wait till they increase production and prices will come down, which is exactly what happened. It's happened in, of, on a lot of high tech, tech items in our uh, lifetime and it will continue to do so. But unfortunately, the Federal Reserve just pumps money in and drives up housing, drives up automobile prices, food prices, clothing prices, you name it, medical prices, college tuition. And so we have all these bubbles and the average person's wages don't keep up with it. That's why real incomes are going down in America. Right. Yeah. And, you know, something else as we were talking that came to mind is, uh, and I think you'll have an interesting opinion on this, is our involvement in Ukraine currently and how we just continue to print money, send it over to Ukraine. And, you know, on one hand, a lot of people, I feel like a lot on the left and even in the middle are bleeding hearts and it's more hu about humanity and they're not thinking about the economy. Um, I'm curious with your background and your family ties to World War II and to the Holocaust, what are your thoughts are on the U.S. getting involved in international issues such as the Ukraine and the Russia war? I grew up during the Vietnam War. I was in college uh, when the Vietnam War began in 1965, when Johnson committed uh, 100,000 plus troops to Vietnam. He made that announcement in July of 1965. I was in my apartment, uh, I had just finished um, uh, summer school, and I listened to Johnson's press conference where he announced this uh, uh, increase, this escalation in Vietnam, telling the American people that if we don't stop the commies in Vietnam, they're going to take over Southeast Asia. That's the domino theory, which is a fallacious theory. 
It's been based, up, based upon a notion that communism trumps nationalism. And we know nationalism is a very powerful force in, in world history. So we've had all these undeclared wars. We haven't had a declared war since December 8th, 1941, when FDR went to the Congress to ask for a declaration of war against the Japanese because of Pearl Harbor. Since then, it's been just encroachment, encroachment, based upon a fallacious theory that we have to fight wars overseas to either promote democracy, which I don't know where it's written in the Constitution, that's our responsibility, or we have to uh, topple dictators. And there's so many dictators in the world, we'd, be, we'd have wars every single day of the week. These wars yeah. are not for the benefit of the American people. They're for the benefit, as Tulsi Gabbard said the other day, for the military industrial complex that President Eisenhower warned us about in his farewell address in January of 1961. I saw that, I believe I saw that in real time. I linked to it in my uh, Substack column today uh, at murraysaban.substack.com. These are the things that the American people don't realize. Here you have a president, outgoing president, former commander, Supreme Commander of World War II, said beware of the industri military industrial complex. They just care about one thing, making munitions and going to war. And um, that's what Johnson did. He did the bidding of the military industrial complex in 1965 because they were eager to uh, fight the, quote, the, the, this uh, uh, communist onslaught in Southeast Asia. Well, I was in Vietnam, Commun uh, communist ruled Vietnam. It's a pretty, uh, ironically, they have a lot of free markets there and they don't like the Chinese. They, they were ruled by the Chinese for a thousand years. They hate the Chinese. They love the Americans because they saw what the Americans were doing to try to stop the war in the 1960s. And so um, people overseas realize that the American government, bipartisan support of Republicans and Democrats, support this uh, untenable policy, this destructive policy of going to war that doesn't benefit the American people and causes havoc overseas. So I've been in the pro-peace uh, camp for decades because I, my, given my own history, my family's history of war, you only fight a war when someone invades you. You don't fight a war because you think you're doing good overseas. And that's the difference between what my father did to protect his, himself and his, uh, his, my mother and uh, his, his fellow uh, Poles in in uh, in Poland and we we and war basically is nothing more than legalized murder let's tell the truth it's nothing more than legalized murder we can't fight anybody because we disagree with them we try to settle it peacefully and so governments have an agenda of their own that have nothing to do with the welfare of their own people yeah i completely agree let's go to commercial and we will jump right back in What is wrong with you? Sorry, I thought I canceled this subscription and I still have it. I really need to figure out how to handle my finances better. Yeah, no, I used to have the same problem. I just use hiatus. Hiatus? Uh, it's super easy, I'll explain it to you. Just no more of those weird growly sounds, please. Download the app. You'll be able to see all your subscriptions and cancel the ones that you don't need or want. See which of your monthly bills are negotiable and hiatus will negotiate for you and you'll be able to set up a custom budget. Last year in Florida, there were 80,000 pregnancies terminated. And here's a sobering statistic. By midnight tonight, when most of us are sound asleep, another 219 precious boys and girls will have been killed in the state of Florida. I'm Mark Mink. I was conceived in an unplanned pregnancy. My teenage birth mother graciously placed me for adoption. Now I'm the state chairman for the Human Life Protection Amendment Citizen Initiative. Our mission is to amend the Florida Constitution through a grassroots citizen effort so the most victimized and vulnerable are protected. To accomplish this, we need almost 900,000 signatures from registered voters across the state of Florida by February 1st of 2024. With the bloodshed of the most precious happening on our watch. I'm asking for your help to build a wall of protection around these preborn lives, a constitutional wall of protection. Their very lives depend upon it.
right, we're back. Thank you very much for coming back, tuning in, folks. All right, I want to jump into something I know you're passionate about, and that is what Biden is talking about with rent controls. And that you living in the New York, New Jersey area, you'll you'll understand and you're well-versed in the history of when this was rolled out in New York City and the lack of success. Talk to us about rent control and what the Biden administration is proposing. You know, just a brief history of rent control in New York City. It was uh, implemented as a, a temporary uh, measure in uh, 1943 during the war where we had general uh, wage and price controls. And after the war ended, the rent control uh, stayed in place. And what happened over time is that as expenses increase for the property owners, for the landlords. Some of them are very small uh, landlords. They own maybe one building or two buildings and um, rents were capped. It was very difficult for them to make uh, a profit in their buildings and landlords literally abandoned their buildings in, in the uh, early 60s. And I taught in the South Bronx in the late 60s, early 70s. I saw the destructive, the destruction of rent control as block after block of buildings were either leveled or abandoned because the property owners could not keep up with the uh, with the expenses. And so you had vast areas of the South Bronx, Harlem, uh, parts of Brooklyn, Brownsville, devastated because uh, the, the politicians thought it's a very good idea to make sure that landlords don't earn a decent return on their investment. And, uh, and then in the 1980s, the city pumped a lot of money in to re uh, rehabilitate these buildings. So you get buildings abandoned, you get uh, crime and other uh, terrible things happening in these inner city areas. And then the city has to tax the, uh, the taxpayers in order to rehabilitate these buildings. So it's a total disaster in terms of what the government does. If Biden wants to do this on a national scale, I don't see how he can get away with it because um, th there's no justification for it economically Unfortunately, uh, a state, a federal judge uh, panel just ruled that New York state rent control laws are constitutional, which is mind boggling, because uh, if you believe that, then you don't have private property. And if you don't have private property, you can't have sustainable prosperity. And you have a gross violation of, of uh, the Fifth Amendment, where it says if you're taking up private property for public use, it's got to be justly compensated. And so Every bad idea that I've seen in my lifetime either comes from Washington or from uh, City Hall in New York City or from Albany or when I was living in New Jersey in Trenton. And now that I'm in Florida, hopefully Tallahassee will have very few bad laws coming out. Uh, uh, hopefully DeSantis uh, knows more than the people who, who preceded him in government because uh, they do the same thing over and over again and expect a different results, which is the uh, definition of insanity. Right. Right, exactly. Can you break down what, what what rent control is for those who are unaware? Well, what happens is that when a landlord has a, a, a rent for a particular apartment, the government says you cannot raise it unless you get special permission from the government. Uh, let's say you, you put in a new refrigerator. They may increase the rent 50 cents or a dollar or two dollars a month or whatever the number is in that community. And so, sometimes you get rent decontrol where um, with when the apartment is vacated, then the landlord can raise the rent, let's say X percent, or they can charge a market rate. So it depends on each locality of what type of particular rent control they have. But essentially, there were people in New York City um, uh, recently that were paying rents that were based upon 1960, 1970 prices. They were paying, wow. let's say, $1,000 a month for an apartment that's probably worth $3,000 a month in the open market. And so it's a huge subsidy to people, which is great for them, but it's terrible for the landlords since uh, they're missing out on income that they deserve because they're not getting a market price for it. So governments have a way of um, taking money out of the pockets of people who should be who should be getting it and putting it into the pockets of other people. So it's a zero sum game. But uh, eventually it, it lowers the quality of housing stock and reduces the supply of housing, which then drives yeah, up it rents sure for does. others. Well, you probably watched the State of the Union last night, and I feel like that was the trend for when I could actually make out what Biden was saying. I was hearing a lot of future talk about he wants to really get government control over. He wants to go even further uh, on the bank fees and the all of the the bank breakdown. Basically, he was talking about the bank statements. He wants to break it down, overdraft fees, yada, yada. So he wants to go even more uh, government authority on the banks. 
But also, this was new, at least for me. I heard him talk a lot about airlines and the airline industry and how he wants to abolish all of these different fees and, and just really dive in to airline companies. And I'm just so confused on why he thinks this is even feasible. Uh, I mean, I, I feel like airlines are already struggling as is. Um, talk to me about what you took from the State of the Union last night. Well, uh, from an overall perspective, what he's asking for is to take the New Deal and Great Society and put it on steroids and just expand the size and scope of government and mandate and regulate every aspect of our lives. When he said that the oil companies will be around for another 10 years, I mean, this is insanity. Energy. This is energy fascism. I mean, people need uh, uh, coal and oil, especially oil and natural gas, in order to heat their homes, drive their cars, drive their trucks, and so on and so forth. This notion of green energy is a total disaster. It's it's uh, not feasible um, the way it is structured today. And they don't believe in markets. They don't believe in supply and demand. They don't believe in entrepreneurship. And when he says, I'm a capitalist, uh, I mean, th that's a big lie because capitalism is not about regulating the private sector. It's, a lot, it's letting the private sector do what it do, does best, which is provide goods and services for people at lower and lower prices. That's the essence of capitalism and free enterprise. And uh, I hear Biden talk about he's going to do this and that and the other thing. And he didn't talk about what it would cost. And of course, he wants to raise uh, taxes on wealthy people. And if he increases tariffs, that's a tax on low and middle income folks because a tariff sometimes gets passed on to consumers in higher prices. So when he says that taxes won't go up for people making less than 400,000, he's not telling the truth because a tariff is a tax. Right. They're just going to work it into the cost. So, yeah, government overreach was the theme last night. Um, I, I'm also curious what you thought about how Republicans responded when when Biden was really just lying through his teeth with all of them right there. Uh, what were your thoughts on the outrage that we witnessed coming from the Republicans? I would imagine some of them had to take some medication to stay calm during his speech because uh, <laughs> things that he was saying, namely the border is, is we're working on the border. He had control with the Congress. The Democrats had control for two years and we've had a flood of immigrants coming in. Being an immigrant, I don't want to shut the door. That would be hypocritical on my part. But we came here the legal way. My father was interviewed in West Germany thoroughly because of his uh, activities during World War II. In other words, he, he didn't, we didn't come here by the back door and, and get uh, interviewed here. He was interviewed in West Germany. So if people from South America and Central America want to come here from the Caribbean, stay in your home country, go to the American embassy or consulate, get interviewed, make sure you you're, you're, don't have a criminal record, make sure you have a sponsor like we did coming to America so that sponsor would take care of you so you wouldn't be a burden on the taxpayers. And if, if there are job opportunities, there are 11, 10 million job uh, vacancies in the United States. I don't know how many uh, of the high level jobs immigrants can fill. But the point is, there's a lot of work in America that could be done. This is a simple solution. It's called staying at home and getting vetted. That's the solution and getting a sponsor. If they did that, we would end the crisis at the border and we wouldn't have people crossing the, uh, the Rio Grande, some, some of them pregnant, uh, in bad physical shape. And we don't know if people are coming in with any uh, sort of illnesses, tuberculosis, COVID, you name it. And so it seems to me this is a humanitarian breakdown that is uh, responsible right at the feet of the Biden administration. Yes, I concur. I want to pivot to you wrote a book about taxation. And I'm curious if you believe in the sentiment that taxation is theft. Oh, there's no question about it. It's an, in, as economists would say, it's an involuntary exchange. That's a polite way of saying stealing. I mean, there's no way of getting around it. Uh, the, 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 the taxation is the the coerced obtaining of funds from the people. And so, in my book, I I pointed out tax free 2000. We essentially could have a tax free America, which is, we had a lot of that before world uh, before uh, the income tax. Uh, the only taxes we had were, were tariffs and some excise taxes, and that was about it. And so, um, and the country prospered for a hundred plus years without an income tax, without all these taxes. And so, the point I make in that book is that the taxation issue is really a spending issue. 
everything that the government does except national defense, which we don't have, we have a huge military industrial complex, everything the government does can be done by the private sector or the nonprofit sector. Therefore, there's no need for this huge uh, leviathan in Washington, D.C., uh, regulating and spending money on infrastructure, and the private sector can do infrastructure. We have private railroads, we have private cruise lines, we have all these infrastructure utilities, uh, we have private roads to some extent. Uh, the history of America is private turnpikes built with private capital. So there is enough capital in the United States and around the world for all these things to be done by the private sector who can do it more efficiently, more effectively. and. Um, and, and, and keep the, the country going in a very positive direction. Instead, we have a huge bureaucracy in Washington. We have a, uh, an IRS that doesn't produce anything. All it does is harass taxpayers. And so we need to go back to the basics of what does it mean to have a free society? And that's really the essence of that book on taxation called Tax Free 2000. Fantastic. I'd like to read that one as well cover to cover, because that is that is important. We need to be able to understand that you can thrive without taxation as is. Um, we're coming up on just two minutes left, but I wanna ask you an important question that I've been covering sure. lately. Do you feel that people as a whole are so focused on what's happening in Washington that they lose focus on local county and city leaders and therefore they are getting away with whatever they want? That's a great point because uh, this is where uh, politics and uh, and a, a free economy go hand in hand. Everything takes place at the local level. We live in a, in a one geographic area. We work there. Everything that is important in our lives is within probably 50 miles of where we live. So we should concentrate on making sure we have good roads, good schools, good medical care, um, uh, good retailers in our area. And Washington tries to do the big stuff and it's failing miserably with Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid. Those programs are financially unsound. And so we should stick to what's going on locally to improve our communities, uh, work with nonprofits uh, who do very great work, Habitat for Humanity. We just donate to the local Habitat for Humanity. They have a big drive. We donate still to nonprofit health centers up in New Jersey, which uh, one of them I helped create, the others I support because I've been the supporters for a couple of uh, decades uh, up there. They're doing great work. And so these are things that I do personally in order to pr improve the community that I live in. I love that. I'm finding just recently that there is a lot going on at the county level, even here locally where I live, that I had no idea about, such as Eugene, Oregon, not too far from me, where they're no longer going to allow gas hookups in new builds in new homes. And, you know, and the list goes on on what's happening behind closed doors. So we need to stay vigilant. Can you share with people where they can find you? Yeah, I write on Substack, murraysabrin.substack.com. I have a short piece today on the State of the Union message. Uh, my uh, books are available on Amazon. Uh, my uh, autobiography is from, uh, from Immigrant to Public Intellectual in American Story. And the publisher priced it so low that he hopes people will buy multiple copies and give them out to their friends, relatives, colleagues, uh, business partners, what have you, because I'm very proud of this book. It covers my uh, rival America and it ends with my uh, 1997 New Jersey gubernatorial campaign when I became the first third party candidate to receive matching funds, which required me to be in the base with the, the three major, uh, the two major party candidates. And um, we had some impact. Um, uh, down the road after the election in terms of getting the speed limit raised, uh, automobile uh, insurance deregulation, uh, free speech, uh, a whole host of things we got accomplished. And you don't have to win as a third party to get to impact uh, uh, public policy. The perfect example is 1912 Socialist Party platform. They didn't win anything, but virtually everything's been enacted in the past hundred years. Absolutely. I think you are a true inspiration and people can learn from you. So please pick up his books, get them all. <laughs> I think you've written more than two. So check them out. Um, it's been an absolute honor to have you on here. There's so much more we could dive into. We should do this again. Thank you very much for tuning in, everybody. Always a great guest on KSOC Uncensored. We'll see you next Thursday.